Arirang Special. Hello everybody and welcome today to this uh, panel discussion on the eve of history, uh, as they're saying. Um, so I'm delighted to be hosting here today and to introduce you to our panelists. So I'll start at this end. We have Professor Kim Jin Hyung from Handong University in South Korea, an international relations specialist. Next to him is Dr. Kim Ji Yun from the Asan Institute for Policy Studies in Seoul. She is an expert on uh, American politics and polling in particular. Next to her, we have John Delury from Yonsei University in South Korea, actually an expert on China, but uh, also very interested in North Korea and this process. And then next to me, I, we have Sean Ho from the Raja Ratnam School here in Singapore, who'll be able to give us a local perspective on, on these talks. So thank you very much for coming along. Uh, we'll talk for about 90 minutes today, and I'll ask a few questions to start off, but I really hope that this will be an interactive discussion, and I encourage you all to ask questions of our uh, panelists up here. So please do um, store up some good ones for them. Uh, so first up, you know, there is a lot of noise out there about the summit. Uh, I thought I was taking a break from Twitter to come here, and then I see I'm actually right next to this little Twitter bird. Uh, but there's a lot of noise, a lot of naysayers, a lot of doubters, a lot of blind optimists out there for, you know, what is really an unprecedented event by, you know, there's a lot of commentary that this is Groundhog Day, this is 2005 all over again, this is two, uh, 1994 all over again. But this feels quite different uh, to me as a reporter. And I wanted to ask each of our experts, first of all, just to give us like your one minute outline of what your, each of your expectations are for the summit, what you think we can expect to see tomorrow. So we'll start with Professor Kim. Yeah, I'm um, kind of positive side. I think it's kind of, we are right now, we are in the kind of eye of the perfect storm like, mm -hmm. right before epic, epic making history. So many things is going around and the, because, uh, due to the characteristic of two leadership, so, so many different, uh, you know, uh, predictions and the rumors, but I think it's positively, yeah, I'm seeing this as a, it's going to be a, a successful outcome. Only, only part I'm worried about is, is how detailed the agreement. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, I'm, I largely agree with the Professor Kim, um, but I'm still, uh, cautiously, very optimistic though. Um, well, at this point, I think the two leaders, both of them, they put too much at stake, political stake and political capital in there. So I also expect a successful summit. But, you know, the beauty is always in the eyes of the holders and, you know, how to interpret it, it depends on how you see it. Some people probably have some more stringent standards. So other people will say, well, this is really important and significant just by the fact that those two people met. Uh, but all in all, I, I think it will be successful and it's a history, no doubt about it. And then we'll see how detailed, as Professor Kim said, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jilluri? Yeah, uh, well, we, this is just the one minute starter. Mm -hmm, this is the one minute. Uh, so we'll get into these things in more depth, but I would say I'm trying not to have any expectations, mm -hmm. um, sort of picking off Picking up on the, the Dr. Kim's point, um, as someone who is basically an advocate of engagement mm -hmm. and basically thinks this is a good thing, the danger, particularly you know, in general, but in dealing with North Korea, is you, know, you, you arrive at the conclusion before <laughs> the thing occurs. And so, I mean, I think at this point, it's probably better for us to think through and recognize uh, just where, how we got and where are we, uh, rather than setting up expectations, uh, but also in the sense of kind of, you know, assuming this is gonna work just because you wanted it to work, you know? Um, so I'm trying not to have any expectations. Okay. Hopefully that was a minute. <laughs> 
tone. Yes. I see I'm the only Singaporean on the panel, so I think it's uh, going to be nice to kind of welcome everybody here to Singapore first and foremost. For me, I'm cautiously optimistic because I think this is really a historic opportunity and I think both of the North Korean chairman and the US president uh, will realise that this is such a rare chance that may not come again for a very long time to come. So I think in that sense, there will be some kind of basic agreement but the tricky part, of course, is what next? What happens after 12 June? Will they stick to the agreement? Will there be some obstacles that come up along the way, either uh, through uh, subsequent negotiations? So I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about tomorrow. We'll have a good outcome. But then again, it is the start of a very, very long journey. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess the question is, what is success? What is the definition of success or a good outcome in this summit tomorrow? And I mean, for Kim Jong-un, probably it's a success just because it's happening. He's going to have these photos that can go on the front page of the Nodong Shinmun on Wednesday morning, showing him as the peer of the leader of the United States of America, right? But President Trump has basically signaled now, he's been dialing back expectations over the past few days and has signaled kind of that he would almost be happy with a meet and greet as well, that this is the start of a process perhaps, you know, the pilot episode of the next, you know, reality TV series that's going to play out in a number of stages over the next few months. Um, but in terms of kind of substantive putting us on the path to a diplomatic process tomorrow, do the panelists, do you think it matters if it's just a vague agreement in principle, you know, very similar from what we saw on April the 27th at the Inter-Korean summit? Or does it need to be, you know, to make a difference this time, does it have to be a detailed outline for denuclearization, for normalization, for sanctions relief? Like, how, what is the definition of success for you? Okay, let me, let me uh, answer that question. I think both leaders need definitely photo sessions. <laughs> I, I don't think anything wrong with it, uh, anything wrong with it, because at least they're finally sitting mm -hmm. on the negotiating table is a big thing, it's a historic thing. So I don't want to underestimate that, but as you said, that's not enough for, we to, for us to call the success. I think it's two things. I think whether it's um, abstract or vague or detailed roadmap, I, but at least, even if it's a vague statement or de declarations, that there should be two essence substance should be in it if we call it success. Number one is timeline. Mm -hmm. For the past 25 years, any negotiation doesn't have any timeline. It's just one by one. And another one is somehow they have to reach the agreement on CVID, whether you, they use CVID or not. That's, that's two things. Okay, at least if they have the, these two things in the declaration or whatever, then we can call it success. But if we can, it's a great success, mm -hmm. and then in this more detailed, especially the, the, the beginning part, fr uh, front part, how many and how much, how big North Korea can uh, concede mm -hmm. and promise to do. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't really think Kim Jong Un is only looking for a part of a photo app. I mean, uh, uh -huh. it's, it's, I mean, you probably have read the Nodong uh, Daily News uh, that they were covering it pretty sincerely and what is going on, and he's in Singapore. So that means also he's putting a lot of effort in there, and he really wants the successful summit result. Mm -hmm. And I agree with Professor Kim that um, in order to be successful, then it needs some timeline. It's not really the vague and the good and the relationship we're going to build on. That's all, you know, yes, it can be BS, I'm sorry. But, mm -hmm. uh, but So it can be concrete with the timeline within the three months, within the six months, that we can do this and that. Uh, that will be really uh, meaningful and it has a huge implication, I think. Um, well, the reason that I think it can be successful, one of the reasons is uh, because Kim Jong-un flew here. I mean, mm -hmm. otherwise, you know, there's no necessary mm -hmm. for him to do it, even using the Chinese air jet. Um, so we are uh, thinking that, and also if you compare that with the grid framework in, in Geneva um, in 1994, the, the person who is signing agreement is totally different. It's the Gallucci and Kang So-Chi cannot really compare with, you know, the Trump and the Kim Jong-un. So 
that's one of the reasons why the, like, a lot of people, and also Korean government says it can be successful if there's any joint statement. Mm -hmm. And also if there's a more detailed part, it can be a timeline, it can be the method, then we can call it pretty much a success. Yeah. Dr. Kim, why do you think Kim Jong-un wants this summit? Why is he so eager for it? Well, if you look into the North Korean society right now, I mean, this, it needs, uh, desperately uh, needs investment from the foreign companies and the foreign countries as well. I mean, the sanction, maybe it's not really working at this point, practically at the people's level, but a lot of people and experts are expecting that it's going to be in effect in the people's daily life, probably uh, starting from uh, the end of this year. So he promised that he is going to improve the people's lives you know, economically, and it's going to be 30, if I remember correctly, of his you know, five-year economic plan. So this is a really critical point, a critical year for him. So he really needs to do something economically, and then at this point, he needs to the sanction to be lifted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And John, as our resident American, I'm going to ask you, what does President Trump want from this? What is motivating him to come to the table? Oh, that's mean, Anna. I haven't lived in America in quite a while. <laughs> so I think Dr. Kim is uh, the America expert. Um, no, I'd rather respond to your original question okay. um, about, I'm very interested in the text. Hopefully there's a text. We, I guess we don't know for sure that they will release a text, but I think they should. I hope they do. It seems maybe they're still scrambling to get some of it done. But, but that could be OK. Uh, so recently, in anticipation of this, as you mentioned, I work on China a lot and US-China relations. And so I went back and looked. Again, I looked at it before, but at the Shanghai communique, you know, the classic text. Uh, this is the testament to the diplomatic genius of Henry Kissinger, you know, if you believe that, and sort of the, the perfect communique by some standards in 1972. And I think there are some analogies, Nixon going to China with, with this meeting in Singapore. So it was interesting to look at that text and reflect a little bit on it. And actually, reading that and, and my own view of what's going on and what's important about going on, I'm looking for different things. I'm not so interested in the details. Mm -hmm. uh, if CVID is in there, that's great. However, as far as Americans are concerned, the skeptics of this process, if CVID is not in there, they're going to say, see, there's no CVID. Mm -hmm. If CVID is in there, they're going to say, you can't trust the North Koreans. They just say they're doing CVID. You know? <laughs> so it, to some extent, it doesn't really matter. Um, what I'm interested in is not the details, but the, the language and the spirit of the communique, if there is one, mm -hmm. and how much the two sides are able to communicate uh, to their publics, mm -hmm. to the North Korean public, to the American public, uh, that the two sort of teams and leaders are able to communicate, we're really ready. We are in a position, both sides see we really can transform this relationship. And to me, denuclearization is a, is a manifestation of that. Um, but the core of it is transforming the relationship. So that's, that's more the framework that I will use to, to measure mm -hmm. the success uh, or not of the document. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I add something? Sure. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, but yeah, whatever the result is, especially skeptics in Washington actually very ready to attack, criticize this. But for the, considering that we need some kind of substance, some kind of a promise or timeline, because we already went through the, the up and downs, those you know, derailing moment like a couple of weeks ago. So that means we need some kind of defending, uh, the, the reserve that, that can defend those uh, backlash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I may, I agree with that. But to me, that and that could be in the document, and it's not bad. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, almost more important than the document or relating to specifics would be actions. Uh, and they could be announced right. as well as written in. Uh, but that is something that I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. Can the two sides announce commitments, actions? They're going to take so-called front-loaded things, mm -hmm. fairly big steps. People say, wow, mm -hmm. not the word CVID, but 
concrete action on both right. sides. Mm -hmm. And that would uh, very much strengthen the spirit of a document that articulates a new framework for the US-North Korea relations. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, obviously denuclearization is the big focus in the United States and the, the thing that everybody is focusing on there. But I was kind of struck uh, by the editorial in the Nodong Shimon this morning, which seemed to put this in a much bigger context. And it talked about how this is the start of a new era. And it was talking very much about normalization. It was looking that this is not just denuclearization. It's also a peace regime. And you know the bigger picture, looking at 70 years of history on the peninsula here. So, And obviously, that's something that's very important to South Korea. So uh, what do you think are the prospects for them making progress in terms of setting out a timeline to end the Korean War, you know, to sign a peace treaty? I mean, and what is South Korea's role in this? Because although South Korea is not a signatory to the armistice, obviously it has a very, very big interest in the process. So maybe we'll start down here with Professor Kim. Yeah, you're right, because this, I think it's most, uh, I think the South Korea is the really in a, in a kind of uh, quiet. They're waiting for the good result. They're very careful. They were cautious. But they don't want to overdo it uh, at this time. Uh, yes, you're right. Uh, because it, this nuclear issue, North Korean nuclear issue is the black hole. It sucks up everything. Mm -hmm. But President Moon, I don't think President Moon thinks this, this is the, 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 the whole process of peace process. This is part of his process, but it is big. It is, it is like a, a main gate to go through. Mm -hmm. And then after that, then finally we can start peace process. So this is the, this is the, the gate we have to pass. In that sense, uh, because it looks like as a, as Korea is kind of passed. It's, it's a, between the, the US and, and North Korean uh, dealing. But after that, I think they're ready to uh, take driver's seat again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, you know, in the um, Panmunjom statement, um, there are basically two messages. One is about denuclearization of the North Korea, and actually it is the Korean Peninsula. And then the second message that struck to a lot of Korean people was ending the war. So they said, I mean, we will declare the end of the war uh, within a year. Um, it may sound weird, but to a lot of Korean people, maybe uh, the ending the war is more, um, how can I say, uh, it has a more meaningful than the denuclearization of mm -hmm. the Korean Peninsula. I mean, this is a traumatic memory for a lot of Korean people. I mean, even myself, in my generation, we were educated that, uh, you know, the, the fe how fearful, how scary the Korean War was. Mm -hmm. And then, even though we have been living in uh, almost like 70 years without a war, but you know, every time there's a provocation, the people start to have their traumatic memories. So I think that is probably the point the South Korean government can actually get in. I mean, this denuclearization, of course, is important to Korean Peninsula and South Korea as well, but it is the matter should be resolved basically the North Korea and the United States. But if you go over this uh, phase, and uh, after this one, if there's a talking and discussion about uh, uh, the en uh, ending the war and the declaration and maybe the peace treaty as well, then that is where the South Korea that absolutely uh, got in. And this is a very important Korean people. Yeah. Well, of course, everybody is like in agreement in principle that ending the war is a good thing, right? <laughs> the, the devil is in the details here and that it's at what price. What does North Korea want for this. Like, the Moon government in South Korea has been quite uh, adamant that Kim Jong-un is not insisting on the withdrawal of American troops from South Korea. Um, but I, I mean, would anybody like to speculate on what, you know, what kind of wiggle room there is in there, whether this will uh, lead to a scaling back of military exercises, joint military exercises in South Korea? Well, you know, kind of what are, what are, when we talk about ending the Korean War and a peace regime, what are the steps to get there? Sean? Yeah, so I was at the Shangri-La Dialogue recently and I remember the speeches that were given, and I think the U.S. position is, is very clear. The issue of uh, U.S. troops on the Korean Peninsula is not going to be on the table for negotiations tomorrow, 12 June, at the summit. 
And I think that's, that's a wise move because that is obviously a sensitive issue. And to put that on the table at this point in time, I don't think it will help the process. I think it's something that will come up at a certain point in the future, but not mentioning it now is, is, is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Keep the momentum going and focus on the denuclearization issue mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kim, do people in South Korea feel worried that this might be on the table, especially given that President Trump has talked about, you know, these rich countries should be paying to defend themselves? Like, are people worried that this, this may lead to a, you know, scaling down of USFK? Well, uh, we, I didn't really conduct a public opinion poll recently, because it's always a big call, not, not a public opinion, but President Trump, who knows that he's going to cancel or whatever to do. Uh, but um, at this point, a lot of South Koreans have a really high expectation and hope for this summit to be successful. And maybe because of that, uh, the President uh, Moon Jae-in, his approval rating went up again. So it's around, it's so usually around like a 70, 75 percent um, yeah. level. So. Um, well, I don't really think that is the matter or issue at this point. They just just want to see that um, those two big men, you know, happy together and handshakes and have some agreement, uh, which can bring the peace in the Korean Peninsula. You, you know what? Because I think if there's like a since between, I think it's since uh, since 2013, you know, kind of crisis situation ratcheted up. You know, so people are really afraid of and even tired of being in the crisis situation. So, Korean people are really focused on that at this moment. Uh, ironically enough, if we didn't have that kind of crisis moment, I don't think people really concentrate on this peace process. So, ironically, people are really desire for peace. So that's why one of the reasons why Moon Jae-in is, is so popular and support from the people for this peace process. Mm -hmm. you know, if I could jump in on the, the US troop issue, we, we talk so much about that. Um, there's very little discussion, at least outside, uh, about you know, this is, this, the US troop presence is quite small, really, at the end of the day. I mean, it could probably go smaller without compromising security. But to begin with, I mean, if we're talking about a real war, 28,500 or 30,000 American troops are not going to be the ones protecting South Korea, nor are they going to invade the North, right? It's, it's our students, the male students, who are conscripted into an army of, what is it, over 600,000. South Korea has one of the largest you know, armies. I mean, it's quite unnatural, uh, the fact that South Korea, at its level of economic development, uh, needs universal conscription. Um, so I think this leads to another issue, which is if this is a real process, uh, and, and it's a peace process, because there's not going to be a denuclearization process without a peace process. Mm -hmm. If this is a real process, if Kim Jong-un, if this is not a North Korean trick, uh, then we're all going to have to start thinking a little bit more boldly about all these questions, you know, the status of the US military footprint, the presence in South Korea, the status of South Korea's own military posture, its size, and, and how it's kind of set up against North Korea. Because of course, if this is a real process, North Korea is going to be doing that as well. Mm -hmm. You know, one of, the, one of the deep problems, what's held North Korea back, is a culture of militancy, a system that is defined by its own militancy, its hostile relations with pretty much everyone, and in, in terms of political economy, way overspending on defense and falling behind the rest of the region because they couldn't get out of that trap. I, I think it's one of the things Kim Jong-un is addressing. Mm -hmm. And so again, if that's a real process, that means North Korea is gonna be making these changes, ready to change it, the size of its troops, the posture of its forces. So we need to start doing at least the thinking of what are we ready for on our side to reciprocate that process. Mm -hmm. But we've got these certain, it's, it's almost sacred cows. I mean, we don't even want to think about it. You don't even go there. Mm -hmm. This process is moving pretty quickly, um, and that's both good and bad. But in our own thinking, at least our discussion, we need to start to at least think ahead to how can we imagine uh, a region where you don't have this constant hostility of North Korea, so then how can we relax? 
Well, I think one country that would be very happy if USFK got even smaller is, of course, China. Uh, how do you see John China's role in this whole process? Obviously, Kim Jong-un didn't even try to hide the fact that he took an Air China plane uh, to come here today, and Xi Jinping has obviously had these two meetings with, uh, with Kim Jong-un in the lead up to the summit. There was a lot of speculation in Washington about what Xi Jinping may have said to Kim Jong-un at that second meeting in Dalian. Like, how do you see the Chinese role in this? Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, here as a, as a historian, I mean, I'm working on a project, a paper, looking at an earlier period, the late 70s and early 80s of China-North Korea relations. And uh, the summitry, the summit diplomacy between Deng Xiaoping, who had took an o taken over in China, and both Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il, because that was kind of the transition period for the North Koreans. And you know, in my research, it was, it was bizarre where you know, one of the things in that period is Kim Il-sung uh, meets with Deng Xiaoping in Dalian, hmm. at that island. And in fact, if you watch the North Korean documentary of Kim Jong-un's trip, there's a part where he goes into a room and he walks over and he stares at a photograph. And it's the photograph of his grandfather meeting with Deng Xiaoping and Hu Yaobang. You know? yeah. So these guys all know this history. But it's very hard. The diplomatic history of China and North Korea relations is very, very difficult. Because, for example, in a period like that, in the early 80s, there's a flurry of back and forth. Lots of meetings, high level meetings. But it's basically a, a symptom of how bad the relationship is, how many things they have to discuss. It can look like, oh, they're well coordinated. Actually, they have to meet a lot because they have a lot of issues on both sides that they're trying to resolve. So when we see after six years, Kim Jong-un doesn't go to China, and I'm sure he could have gone if he wanted to. At six years, he's like this. And we all know the Chinese are extremely frustrated would be the nicest way to put it. Now suddenly two visits. Right. They, you know, what's have, really going on? I'm not sure we know. <laughs> they, they have a lot to catch up, actually. Sean, <laughs> <Right. laughs> sure, what do you think? What's really going on there in this relationship between them? Actually, I was equally surprised when I saw the Ronong Shin Moon uh, this morning and the fact that they published the photo of the Air China aircraft, the big Chinese flag there, no, made, made no attempts to hide it, and it was just next to the entry exit door. So I wonder what people in North Korea, when they see this, it's like, wow, our, our chairman is going overseas. He's not taking our own plane. He's taking an Air China plane. You know, what does it mean about China's role on the Korean Peninsula? I think all these symbols are, are worth reading into. Mm -hmm. And obviously, from the China perspective, uh, China continues to have a major stake in the Korean Peninsula issue. China is not going to be sidelined from this issue. And China seems to be ready to support North Korea in, in ways that it requires. Uh, that's the symbolism I, I see from the last few months of interactions between North Korea and China. And uh, it's, it's really out of mutual interest rather than any, any love between the, the two sides. Right, yeah. Yeah, I, I visited China recently several times. I think they have a dual mind, okay? They want North Korean issue resolved because it has been the target and the leverage used by Washington to pressure them. But at the same time, they, to them, this is a new, new era and a new kind of uh, uh, game, totally different game. So they're afraid. What if? they are uh, always been the, their, their uh, partner, but what if North Korea is more tilting toward uh, the US? And that they're, that's why we're, they're worried. And they're waiting like, like a uh, Korean government before this summit. But if succeed or whatever it is, and they're ready to jump in, that act as a real player. They're ready, yeah. That's their attitude. Right. And no matter what the result of the summit would be, uh, I think China is going to be pretty different from before or previous um, behavior. Um, if it's success, uh, then China, as Professor Kim said, is just really ready to jump in. If, even if it fails, they are probably very proactively go for uh, for North Korean policy. Very different from before, I think. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> oh, excuse me. We should cover for you, Anna. <laughs> <coughs> I was going to say, and many. Oh no, I have to. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, I'll just help. talk. <laughs> um, no, I would. 
I would echo the, the sentiment. I think you expressed that very well about the Chinese. I don't think it's a dilemma. Um, yeah, I don't think it's a dilemma. It's a, there's a, a, a ambivalence. That's not quite the right word either. There's two sides to it. And I think you know, to, it's important for the three drivers of this process, for the two Koreas in the United States, not to, not to poke at that too much. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's probably tempting sometimes to poke at that. Okay. But that's, that's a losing proposition because fundamentally, uh, if, if the three parties are sincere about what they're trying to do, as Professor Kim explained, China fundamentally supports that it's in its interest. What we're seeing is literally, ten, for 10 years, the Chinese have been saying denuclearization, peace and stability in the Korean Peninsula through dialogue and negotiation. Right. This is exactly what's happening. You know, so China is not in key in the room. But the process is what they've been calling for. You know? So it's important. Uh, Kim Jong-un, whatever's going on in those conversations, he's made a real effort to involve Xi Jinping. It's fascinating that he would include the picture of the Chinese flag. But that's also a symbol of bringing China in. The last report I saw is that, uh, confirms, this could be wrong, Anna, but I thought Secretary Pompeo is, is going to China after this or somehow conferring. Maybe that's wrong, but she, uh, President Trump has continued to emphasize his conversations with Xi Jinping. He keeps thanking Xi Jinping. You know, so there are ways in which, and I don't know, maybe you can speak to President Moon, but it's very important for the three players, you know, for Seoul, Washington, and Pyongyang, even though really at some level it's ultimately about them. I mean, the signatories of the armistice no longer define the real parties to the conflict. But China is critical to progress. You know, and so it's important to keep China constructively engaged and involved. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, <laughs> one other issue, I think, which uh, you know, it's striking that it's kind of disappeared in a way when you think back to President Trump's speech in the National Assembly in Seoul in November last year when he was describing North Korea as a hell on earth in which no one should live in and things and this kind of human rights discussion has entirely gone away in, to, in the official speak really. I mean President Trump has said it did not come up in his meeting with Kim Jong-chol in Washington. Do any of you think there's any space here for human rights to be discussed in this forum? Do you think it should be? Do you think President Trump will bring, bring this up and, and view this opening engagement process as a way to not just reduce the threat to the outside world, but as a way to you know, reduce the threat inside North Korea to the North Korean people? Well, I'll jump in quickly. I do, strongly. But I also see uh, in my own thinking and language and in what I hear, um, I, I feel the lack, there's a void uh, in, in in finding the opportunity in this new pattern to advance human rights or advance uh, the condition, the human flourishing of the average North Korean. Because you look at Nick Kristof wrote, wrote an op-ed I just read this morning. It's very strong, and I know what he's trying to say. But there's also something, you know, our human rights language about North Korea is really from last year and previous years when we're not in really dealing much with the North Koreans and they're not showing some of these positive tendencies and the kind of opening that we're seeing in Kim Jong-un. And so it's very difficult. How do you continue to advance the, the interest, the cause that we feel in promoting, decreasing the suffering and promoting uh, uh, the, the, the security and the rights of North Koreans in a way that encourages this process, you know, rather than it does, it does run the danger of shutting it down, mm -hmm. you know? And then it's a lose-lose mm -hmm. because the previous approach, I think it's hard to argue it's been, you know, the censure and the criticism. It's hard, I think it's hard to argue that has resulted in an improvement of human rights on the ground, which is the goal, mm -hmm. right? That's the goal. So I'm not sure uh, anyone's figured out how to articulate how to bring it in. Yeah. Yeah, let me add to that. I actually, I think there should be, the moment for the right time. I think is, uh, human right is important, and it should be dealt somehow in some day. We have a history, and actually US have a history, has a history of like a Vietnam case. They didn't put, you know, bring the human right issue at front. You know, they can, uh, and, and a Helsinki process, actually three process in time series. First, no aggression pact, and then inter-block, uh, 
uh, exchange or cooperation. And the last one is the human rights issues. I think we should bring in some in, in some day, but I don't. At this time is like a, a very a beginning point of uh, making uh, you know confidence or trust. So I don't think it's a good idea right now is to put this. But I, I and North Korea knows that it's coming. Well, if I just add only just two lines, uh, probably at the time that uh, the U.S. decides to normalize the diplomatic relations. That's probably the time that they uh, raise the human rights issues. I mean, if you look at the, um, how the, the U.S. Um, normalized diplomatic or established diplomatic relations with other countries, then there was always the human rights issues came up. So that's probably the part of time, the right time, I would say. And otherwise, at this time, I mean, it's the beginning of the talk. It's too much of risk to raise. Yeah. So I agree as well that human rights is important, but again, because it is a North Korea-US summit, and from the American perspective, the number one priority is the denuclearization issue, the denuclearization process. Of course, there are many, many issues that involve other countries as well, Japan's abduction issue, you know, various issues that need to be talked about, including the human rights issue. But from the American perspective, will the human rights issue and the abduction issue really go above the priority of the denuclearization issue, considering if reports are to believe Kim Jong-un may actually leave at 2 o'clock tomorrow, giving you five hours, mm -hmm. denuclearization has definitely got to be the number one priority for the Americans. And unfortunately, at this time, human rights and abduction issue will probably just be a mention in passing, just to raise it with them, but not to go into detail. Mm -hmm. Okay. On that note, um, let's open it up to the audience. If anybody out there has questions to ask the panelists, please stand up or wave your hand. I think we have microphones. Over here, we have another question. Uh, I'm a Chinese reporter from Caixin Media. Uh, I was wondering about the possibility about the both Koreans uh, might sign a treaty on the prohibition of a nuclear weapons. And uh, what would you say the possibility of South Korea's get rid of American nuclear umbrella? Thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough question. But I I think they, uh, North Korea, inter-Koreans, inter at this moment, is only North and the South to sign the, some kind of that kind of treaty is not really a high possibility, I think. It's a, uh, the first, the most important thing is the denuclearization issue solved between the U.S. and the North. Um, but regarding, let's say, regarding uh, ending the, de ending the uh, de uh, declaration of ending war issue is, is it's more like a political. Uh, already in Panmunjom, already they declared, uh, uh, North and the South Korea uh, declared it, and I, it's okay for, for South Korea, uh, if US and North Korea declare tomorrow, it's a, it's a, it's a, and then trilateral declaration can come later on. So all those kind of, uh, uh, declaratory or political or rhetorical uh, declaration is okay, but some kind of uh, signing off is a different dimension, I think. Well, just to add to that, um, the signing treaty is totally different from the declaration mm -hmm. ending the war. There's a political rhetoric, so you can just do it. Um, but in terms of the treaty, well, definitely, I mean, we, well, practically, the technical terms, South and the North, we can just sign the treaty. But the thing is, it's not going to be effective without the United States. And to enhance the power of it, uh, that's why we, you know, a lot of people say that we need China in there. And then that is totally different process and different things that you have to go through. So, so there are some people who are confused with that, but it's a uh, different thing. And the same thing to, to nuclear umbrella, too. That's, that's too sensitive that only you know, two Koreas could decide. How about over here? I think there's a question on this side. Uh, hello, uh, my name is uh, Carissa. I'm from the Straits Times in Singapore. Um, my question is, what is the most likely outcome of the summit and how will it affect South Korea, particularly President Moon Jae-in? Thank you. What is the most likely outcome, outcome of the summit and how, how will it affect where, President where Moon Jae-in? Oh, she's over there. <laughs> I couldn't see her. Sorry, I'm like behind <laughs> everything. I just can see her. 
-hmm. How will it affect the popularity of Moon Jae-in and, and what, what's the law? Well, it's already reflected in his approval ratings. Um, as I said, uh, his approval rating, I think it was uh, the highest uh, before and after the inter-Korean summit, the first one, was over 80%. I mean, after one year, he's still maintaining over 80%. It's an amazing number. But at this point, um, I think I briefly mentioned, uh, it is between 70 and 75%, so which is pretty high. Um, and well, Inter-Korea summit was important and increased and improved his approval ratings. And after this summit, North Korea and the United States summit, if it turns out to be successful, then it's going to, of course, add more numbers. So he can probably you know, pick up some numbers. And just to add to that, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure President Moon needs uh, needs a tangible, concrete outcome. You know, if there's a particular deliverable. Uh, obviously, the more detailed North Korea's commitment to denuclearization, the better. Uh, but even even a general one um, essentially passes the bar, you know, of um, uh, anyway moving this process forward, and then would allow President Moon to pursue the inner Korean peace because you know there's a whole set of things issues that the two Koreas can work on to improve their relationship, security, hard security things and, and uh, reconciliation, cultural exchange, all you know, softer things. And so e even just a okay, so long as there's not a meltdown here in the next 48 hours or on Twitter directly afterward, then President Moon can just say, okay, that went well, and you know, full or speed ahead on our inner Korean process. And you know, that he, he can't get much higher in terms of his approval oh, rating, so it'll just keep going. High. You can go to 90%. I guess. I don't know. Yeah. If it gets to 90, he begins to get into joke territory, yeah. like in Middle Eastern yeah. dictator territory, it yeah, counts right. against him to go higher. But also, I think, like, from my perspective, covering all of this, it seems like he's already like, been successful in that he's got rid of the bloody nose talk and things, the, the, the specter or prospect of military action is gone, so that maximum pressure is over and uh, on this path again now. But you know what, last year actually he was uh, uh, misunderstood as like a zigzagging or wish-wash or sometimes it's called mungone because he's too much in inclined to you know, support uh, maximum pressure of Trump. But now it is interpreted as he's a really patient, a really actually strategic patient. Strategic patient? Yes. <laughs> I kind of disagree with him though at that point because uh, the because the way he behaved last year, I mean, he was showing the how he, he's pro-America and also he's pro the U.S. Uh, ROK U.S. alliance. And that actually gave some confidence to a lot of South Korean people that, you know, because there's always questions about the uh, President Moon Jae-in. Is it too pro-North Korea? Is it too, you know, uh, lenient to North Korea? And that by showing that attitude, I think he actually get rid of all those concerns, and then he could actually move very proactively this year. So that's strategic positioning then. Okay, I'll take <laughs> it. Rather than strategic patience, okay. Okay, down, oh, Don Kirk's got a question down the back. Hi, uh, thanks for taking my question. I just had a small question to ask uh, Mr. Delury. He talks about uh, okay. South Korea's 600,000 man army and, and suggests that maybe the draft isn't a good idea. Uh, he, he neglected to mention North Korea's 1.2 million man army. I wonder whether he thinks that the two might be reduced in tandem. Uh, I wonder if you could address that side of the question, which he uh, happily ignored. Oh, uh, well, I didn't. If you look back at the transcript, <laughs> I said in the context of North Korea changing its posture, South Korea and the United States can change theirs. So, no, absolutely, a reciprocal process. And I think, again, that that's what Kim Jong un actually wants. And he said as much. I mean, part of what he did in the first five, six years of building up uh, this nuclear deterrent was a cost-saving measure to probably bring down defense spending. It's probably one of the reasons why the North Korean economy has been growing by our best estimates, or at least stable, despite a decrease in foreign trade and investment. Probably one piece of that is, I would suspect, 
he's already finding ways, they're finding ways to reduce defense spending. Um, and, uh, and so you could just do more of that. And for the two Koreas to do it together, that's, that's the whole point. I, I've always been interested in the argument of North Korea's nuclear program as an economy measure. So far, there's been no statistical evidence of that, but it's a, it's a fun argument to make. Uh, but Thank you. I, I, I wasn't aware that uh, Kim Jong-un had actually called for a reduction in the size of North Korea's armed forces, which, after all, take up a huge, uh, re help resolve a huge economic and, and unemployment problem for a number of millions of people. Uh, has he actually called for that, or did he just say that he'd like to spend less on defense, or, or, or what? Maybe I miss. I guess I missed something. Right, the latter. Called for re reduction in defense spending, not specifically. He didn't call for reducing the 1.2 million men army, no. did he? Nor has South Korea. Okay, moving along. Who else? Uh, in the front row here. Hi, my name is Hyung, and I'm with the BBC Korea. Um, my question is to anybody who wants to talk about this. Um, so there is a possibility of um, establishment of diplomatic relations between North Korea and the U.S. And one thing that I heard recently that was very interesting to me was that um, having the U.S. as the arch enemy um, is basically um, what the North Korea is all about. So North Korea's regime, North Korean regime's um, justification has to do with having North Korea as an arch enemy. I'm wondering, um, so this is establishment of the diplomatic relations between Washington and Pyongyang, how would the average North Koreans would take it? And um, do you think the transition would be smooth? Would anybody like to answer that? How would the average North Korean take you're not average American, but why don't you try? <laughs> well, all right, yeah, since I'm not average American either. I mean, it is such an interesting question. Um, I guess one way to think about it, and we don't know the answer, one way to think about it, as imperfect as it is, is by analogy, you know? And insofar as there's an element of an analogy to Nixon's visit to China and to the very sudden normalization process of US-China relations, you know, at the time that that happened in 1971-72, you had very similar dynamics where the whole, you know, Chinese machine, the communist propaganda machine, was not over the Korean War and was fighting a global campaign against American imperialism. Uh, it was still the depths of the Cultural Revolution. Uh, but in that moment, Nixon made a strategic decision, I mean, Nixon and, and Mao made this decision that, you know, there was a reason they should come together. And um, the ideology started to twist, you know? And I mean, what we know from Chinese who lived through it in some of the memoirs is there was an element of whiplash, of sort of ideological what's happening, you know? Uh, and I would expect that North Koreans are going through that now. I mean, if you just kind of glance at, at their daily newspaper, the last six months, you know, there's sort of Kim Jong-un with a new foreigner every day you know, and showing up, remember when the K-pop stars went? That was one of the real kind of mind-blowing. And, and this moment, Sean talked about, about the, the Chinese flag, and he's fine with that, you know, getting off the airplane. So I think, I don't know the answer to your question, but it's, it's such an important question. I think that process is already happening now, you know, where, um, where North Koreans are getting a whole new set of messages from their leadership, from Kim Jong-un, about what kind of relationship he wants North Korea to have with countries that has been very hostile um, to something where, no, we can be partners, we can get along. Uh, yes, over here in the front row, please. We'll start we here could in the take front, two, and then we'll go. To then we could take both of them. Then. Oh, yeah. That's a good idea. Why don't we take both of them? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Pablo from ABC Spanish newspaper. There are some reports uh, that Kim Jong-un has invited uh, Donald Trump to visit Pyongyang. So do you think it would be possible for the next month that we can see Trump visiting Pyongyang? And do you think this is like the beginning of an opening North Korea, like in China with the visit by uh, President Nixon in the seven, uh, early 70s? and a similar process that we can see like more freedom in that country. Thank you very much. Anyone want to place bets on a summit in Pyongyang next month? Yeah, well, I already lost 
but I think two bottles of I'll scotch. <laughs> uh, although the other person lost two, but I, I didn't pick Singapore, so I'm already batting low percentage. But um, you know, I think that again, even even the most successful version of the next two days I can imagine, um, Donald Trump and Kim Jong Un meet again, and I do think it's natural. I mean, come on, it has to be on Donald Trump's bucket list to get to Pyongyang. <laughs> and uh, if this process is moving along, he'd have reason to do so. Uh, I think even more interestingly, to your second question, or second half, um, you know, I, I can see Kim Jong-un visiting the United States, American soil, next year. Um, so yeah, and I think that is, um, that's the process that I think is um, maybe at play here. Hmm. John, do you have thoughts on that? Well, it seems like it's a, it's a competition between who gets to go to whose uh, capital first, you know, mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, first uh, Donald Trump seemed to indicate that the talks go well, he's open to inviting Kim Jong-un to the White House, and now, apparently, according to reports, uh, Kim Jong-un himself is also inviting Donald Trump to the White House. But I think in, in, this, in this scenario, anything is possible. You know, we have two people who have surprised us many, many, many times over the last six months, and I wouldn't rule out any kind of possibility mm -hmm. if tomorrow works out well. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Kim, do you think this is start of an, the start of an opening of North Korea? Yeah, um, yeah, of course. And also President Trump, I actually uh, lost two because <laughs> I was betting on Pyongyang uh, for this uh, first summit. Uh, but definitely, I hope because I heard that the President Trump really wanted to visit Pyongyang. And I didn't know, just to think about the U.S. President visiting Pyongyang and landing in Pyongyang, um, that is amazing scene. And that we all know that that's exactly what Donald Trump always would want, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to be photographed by over or the, you know, the, uh, in the world. And yes, I think the North Korea is also very much ready to open. Mm -hmm. And if you look, probably look at the old economy and how different the Pyongyang is, the people living in there on the streets, um, it seems that they are just ready uh, to be invested, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Great, okay, with that, we will wrap it up. Uh, thank you very much to the panelists, Kim ji Yun, Don John Delury, and Sean Ho for coming along uh, for this discussion today. Uh, and thank you to the audience for your great questions as well.